Okay, we are into chapter 16, which is the second half of the immune system. So this half of the immune system is called the adaptive immune system. And uh, this is somewhat unique to mammals and some other organisms. Um, we have things like insects and stuff like that that are animals, but they don't have this adaptive system. We only know that they have an innate system. Um, so this system is critical because it allows our immune system to recognize specific pathogens and build memory to them, which helps keep us healthy uh, and deal with infections much faster. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about uh, the development of um, primary and secondary antibody responses. So those antibody responses are part of what we call the humoral immune system. Um, they deal with extracellular infections. Um, we'll talk about how antibodies actually function, um, both in the adaptive system, but they also tie back to the innate immune system a little bit. And then we will talk about what is called the cellular immunity side of things, which deals with intracellular infections inside of the cell. Uh, this relies on T cells, although T cells play a role in the uh, humoral side as well. And then um, we will also talk about how the immune system prevents auto activation, basically recognizing yourself and uh, how you don't respond to yourself then. So we'll talk about all of these things in this chapter and more. We're gonna start with a case history here. And this is of David Vetter. So he's born in 1971 and he was born completely without an adaptive immune system. Uh, you've probably heard of this story. He was known as the bubble boy because um, so far he's our only human uh, known to live in a plastic germ-free bubble for his entire life. And he lived to the age of 12. So because he was born without an immune system, uh, right when he was born, they put him in this sterile environment. He had a genetic disease called severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, in this uh, patients form no T cells. Um, and this leads to uh, no working B cells or sometimes even no B cells, period. And um, so patients with SCID can't respond in any meaningful way against invading microbes. They have that initial uh, innate system sometimes, um, but they're not able to mount long lasting defenses, which uh, really leaves them open to death by infection quite early. So David's older brother had died of skid. His sister, on the other hand, was healthy. So physicians knew there might be a chance that he would have this disorder as well. It is genetically inherited. So because his brother had it, there's a possibility that he too could have it. Um, so when he's born, he was transferred instantly into this sterile uh, environment. And the hope was that they could give him a bone marrow transplant. Now, this cannot happen when someone is very young. Um, so they needed to wait many, many years, basically, for him to uh, grow and develop and to get strong enough to be able to do this bone marrow transplant. We will talk about where the cells are made, but remember that B cells and some other cells are made in the bone marrow. Um, so this bone marrow transplant, you would take bone marrow from a healthy individual and transplant it into a SCIDS patient, and hopefully they would start to make some adaptive immune cells here. So basically everything in his life had to be disinfected um, and hopefully sterilized. Uh, so they needed special cleaning agents. That's everything, water, air, food, diapers, clothes, everything, toys that went in there into his little plastic bubble. And there's a little airlock in there um, to make sure everything was sterile. Uh, the only way people could interact with him was through gloves in the um, in the in the sterile bubble there. So he's basically in a glove box there. Um, and he lived in that 
sterile bubble for 12 years. NASA, interestingly, made him a specialized uh, sterile spacesuit, basically, um, that he could kind of put on and get outside of the bubble. Uh, but still, he couldn't have any human contact uh, because he always had to be wearing uh, some sort of uh, protection here. So at 12 they decided to attempt the bone marrow transplant and they were going to use his sister uh, as the donee. So a uh, bone marrow transplant, uh, not very fun thing. It is apparently very painful. Um, so uh, very brave of his sister to do this. The problem is, is that um, they didn't realize that she had a very low level of what we call Epstein-Barr virus. Um, in healthy individuals, this is kept at a very low number. Um, when people have uh, weakened immune systems, it can cause lymphomas. So in 1984, this was before widespread use of PCR and things like this. So we had other methods to try to detect this, but they weren't sensitive enough, so they didn't know this virus was present in the sample that they took. Uh, PCR would have been able to detect that because you can detect even the smallest amount of DNA using PCR, but they didn't have it at that point. It's too early. Um, so when they transplanted this bone marrow into David, he had no immune system, which left him basically defenseless to this virus. So he became extremely ill, developed several tumors because of it. The virus can infect cells and change gene expression, leading to tumors. Um, so at this point, they don't really have any options. They had to take him out of his bubble to treat him for this uh, cancer, basically. So it's a bit of a bittersweet moment because his mother was finally able to touch her son without a suit on, basically. But it would be the last time she would be able to do that. Um, because of all the infections that he acquired, he slipped into a coma and ended up dying just before he turned 13. So this illustrates the importance of the adaptive immune system, right? Without it, we would not survive. Um, this adaptive system allows us to withstand a huge number of microbes that are in our everyday environment. And this is why um, people ask me, you know, does being a microbiologist make me a germaphobe? I go, no, because I have an immune system, right? If I didn't have an immune system, yes, I would be very afraid of microbes. But in everyday life, we have our immune system to deal with these. So in 16.1, we're going to start with the basics. We're going to talk about the cell types in there, and we will differentiate between the two branches of the adaptive system. We have this, what we call the humoral system, which is antibodies and B cells. And then we have the cellular system, which is T cells. And that deals mainly with intracellular infections, infections inside of a cell whereas antibodies deal with infections outside of the cell, extracellular. To talk about the adaptive system, we need to throw out some terms like what an antigen is. Uh, we're going to mainly focus on antigen. I will explain epitopes. Uh, we won't go too much into immunogens and haptins. This gets really technical, but uh, it is important to understand what is going on with these ones. Um, and we're going to come back to those cells that we talked about, the antigen presenting cells, because they play a key role in linking the innate system with the adaptive system here. And then we will talk about how uh, the specificity and the memory of this system allows us to develop vaccines. Okay, so in the innate system, we, we talked about all of these cells over here. Uh, Primarily, we were seeing the most white blood cells are neutrophils that do phagocytosis. We also have some key cells that we'll come back to again today, macrophages and dendritic cells. These are what are called antigen presenting cells, and they are going to take antigens from microbes that they absorb and 
take them over to the adaptive cells and show them to them to help build an adaptive response. The adaptive system derives from what we call lymphoid stem cells. Uh, these come from the bone as well. And uh, these lymphocytes, as they're called, are primarily T cells and B cells. There are a group of cells called natural killer cells. We're not really going to talk about them too much. They kind of cross the bridge between the two systems. Uh, we're going to focus on T and B cells here. So they both de uh, develop in the bone marrow. That's why David was waiting for a bone marrow transplant. Uh, the B cells are kind of processed and fully developed in the bone marrow, whereas the T cells need to go to the thymus. That's why they're called thymus T cells. Uh, the thymus is an organ that will help them develop to maturity, basically. B cells are key in making antibodies. Uh, B cells are what start that process happening. Antibodies are proteins that can float around in the blood and the lymph and uh, bind to specific microbes and destroy them. There's a couple of ways they can destroy them we'll talk about. T cells, on the other hand, as I said, develop in the thymus. There's kind of two branches of T cells. There's a group called helper T cells, which really control the whole adaptive immune system. They tie back into the B cells and that system. Uh, they also function with another type of T cell called cytotoxic T cells. These are going to deal with intracellular infections. They're going to attack and destroy infected host cells. Um, there are a lot of different subclasses of T cells. I can't get away from showing some of them, but I do not expect you to have much deeper knowledge than that there are helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, but I'm going to show them. So don't freak out when we get to those parts. So let's look at the big picture here. Uh, what's different between adaptive and innate immunity? The innate system, right, present from birth, but doesn't target specific microbes. It just sees a microbe and attacks it. Um, so it's not very what we would call specific. The adaptive system, on the other hand, develops after it's exposed to a specific antigen. And an antigen is just a molecular shape that triggers an immune response. When it recognizes this, it makes things like antibodies or cytotoxic T cells that are very efficient at destroying the microbe. So the innate system worked well, but the adaptive is like super specialized. They're like the super assassins of the immune system, right? They are well-trained and can destroy microbes very, very well, but they have to recognize specific microbes to do that. That means that it's more complex, which means it's slower to develop. Uh, it does, it is cross-regulated. So there is feedback from the innate system into the adaptive system. And one key here is that memory cells are generated. So the first time you're exposed to something, it takes a while for the adaptive to build up. But the second time you're exposed to something, that memory kicks in and it deals with things much faster. Okay, so let's talk about antigens. In a microbe, let's say a bacterial cell here, there are all kinds of proteins and carbohydrates and all kinds of biomolecules, right? Those molecules have specific shapes. Um, an antigen is a molecule that can cause or elicit an immune response. Um, if we break down this cell, all those cellular components go out. Some of them might be antigens. Uh, proteins tend to be the best antigens. They tend to have the most unique shape so they can cause the best adaptive immune response. So they're the best antigens. Um, polysaccharides will work, but things like nucleic acids, we don't really recognize them well as immunogens or antigens uh, because they don't really have a very unique shape to them. Within an antigen, there can be sub shapes that get recognized. We call these epitopes. I just mention it because it's a very common term that 
I don't know, you may hear of uh, somewhere down the line or it may be thrown out there, but it's basically a specific part of an antigen uh, that gets recognized. And antigens can have more than one epitope. But overall, what's, what's happening is an antigen is a unique molecular shape that causes an immune response. This response is not quick. It can take many, many days for this to kick in. So the adaptive immune response really begins when cells of the innate system, the antigen presenting cells, engulf a microbe and break it down into the little antigen parts. They take those antigens and put them on the surface. That's why they're called antigen presenting cells, because they will travel through the lymphatic system to a lymph node where they will show these antigens to the T cells and the B cells. Um, we'll get to this again. Um, it's a little more complex what's going on, but the antigen presenting cells bring bits of the microbe to the lymph nodes where they show them where they show them to lymphocyte cells, T and B cells, this is going to cause a response. It could be uh, B cells turning into what we call plasma cells, which make lots of antibodies. The generation of memory cells. There are B memory cells. There are also uh, T memory cells. Uh, or the generation of uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which go out and will attack infected cells. These cells uh, are going to travel through the bloodstream. Uh, the memory cells and the plasma cells go back to the bone and actually hang out in the bone marrow, whereas the cytotoxic T cells will migrate to the site of infection. These cells are gonna release antibodies which will flow through the blood system to the site of the infection. Remember these antigen presenting cells? We have dendritic cells and macrophages. They're gonna present antigens on a special molecule we'll talk about called the major histocompatibility complex. So those two branches I talked about, we have the humoral adaptive system. These are the B cells. Uh, they can bind free floating antigens or there's other ways they can get activated by T cells. Uh, and they're gonna, they're gonna make copies of themselves, the B cells. They're gonna turn into what we call plasma cells. Um, these are B cells that have been stimulated by an antigen and start to produce large amounts of antibodies. An antibody is a protein that's gonna circulate in the bloodstream and will recognize and bind to an antigen. Uh, that will cause various things that can lead to microbes being destroyed. The other half of the immune system is the cell mediated system. This is uh, using those cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic means killing cells basically. So cytotoxic T cells will find infected host cells and destroy them. Uh, they get presented antigens uh, in a different way through helper T cells as well and um, become activated. So they're gonna seek out and destroy infected host cells. The uh, humoral system works outside of cells. It is what we call extracellular. So it deals with extracellular infections because the, the antibodies float around in the bloodstream. The cell mediated deals with intracellular infections, microbes that have gotten inside of host cells and those cells need to be destroyed. Both of these systems are going to be linked by a set of cells called helper T cells. This diagram basically explains the whole chapter and I'm gonna show it about a billion times to help reinforce this. So I've put a line here to divide the two halves of the immune system. We have the humoral system on the left for fighting extracellular microbes and the uh, cell mediated side for fighting intracellular microbes on the right hand side. Okay, so we have an antigen presenting cell that gobbles up a microbe. Its first path really is to meet up with a cell called a helper T cell. This is gonna be key in activating both sides of the immune system. Um, we have, sometimes they directly interact with cytotoxic T cells, but they can also activate cytotoxic T cells through helper T cells. So these get activated and then go out and find infected host cells 
and will destroy the host cells. So the cytotoxic T cells kill infected cells. The other side, uh, there's two things that could happen. There could be antigens floating around in the bloodstream. Those can bind to B cells and activate them. Only certain antigens can do this. Other antigens have to attach to antigen presenting cells, go f deal with uh, helper T cells that then activate B cells, turning them into plasma cells. Plasma cells has lots of endoplasmic reticulum and lots of ribosomes because their whole job is to make a boatload of antibody proteins. Okay, that is the broad overview here. We will dive into each piece in its turn. I just want to talk about the T cells again, just because uh, I keep saying T cell. There are two types that I want you to know about. The cytotoxic T cells, uh, they bind antigens presented by the antigen presenting cells. They get activated. Uh, they go float around and find and kill infected host cells. The helper T cells, they're the link between the two sides of the adaptive immunity. They're key in activating both cytotoxic T cells and the B cells. Um, so we will see them again. Okay, so with that context, right, let's look at this again. Uh, we have our site of infection. An antigen presenting cell engulfs a microbe here and travels to the lymph node. This is going to activate helper T cells, which are either going to turn on B cells or cytotoxic T cells, depending on what type of infection it is. The B cells will differentiate into plasma cells as well as memory cells. Those are going to go to the bone marrow. The memory cells get retained there. The plasma cells start pumping out tons of antibodies. If it's an intracellular infection, the cytotoxic T cells are going to flow through the blood back to the site of infection. If it's extracellular, the antibodies will flow through the blood and meet up with the microbe wherever it's at. Antibodies uh, respond to specific shapes. There are different antibodies for every different antigen that we encounter. Uh, and we have to have ways of measuring immune response. We call that antigenicity. Um, basically, it's it's how much does the antigen piss off your immune system is really the best way to put it. Uh, how much antibody ends up getting made in response to that? Like I said, proteins are the strongest antigens. They're going to make the most immune response, the most antibody. Carbohydrates can also do this. Um, large antigens are very likely to be engulfed by antigen presenting cells. Um, but really, it's all about the more unique the shape, the better the immune system can recognize it. Lipids, nucleic acids, they're too regular. They're not very uh, unique shapes, so they don't get recognized very well. Now, here's an interesting thing. We have this concept of immunological specificity. This is really how well does an antibody recognize its specific target. There are some molecules that have kind of similar shapes, and sometimes antibodies can attack both of them. If an antibody recognizes several different things uh, that all kind of look like the antigen it was made in response of, we call that low specificity. That might sound bad, but actually, interestingly, it can be very good for us because we talked previously about vaccination, which was named for giving people cowpox, which protected them against smallpox. That's because the cowpox antigen looks very much like smallpox antigens. So our immune system kind of mixes the two up and responds to both of them. That's actually really good because we get cross protectivity there. If you're exposed to one, you're immune to the other because you've already built an immune response to it. If an antibody binds with very uh, selective, just to its target antigen, uh, we call that high specificity. This is one of the reasons that we've had so much problem with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the novel coronavirus. Uh, COVID, the disease caused by it, um, 
the the virus is so unique that our immune systems have not seen anything like it before. So we have no cross protectivity because we haven't encountered any antigens that look like the SARS-CoV-2 antigens. Um, so this is why it has been so devastating for us. Things like the flu, we've had them circulating in our population for probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So we do have a little cross protectivity, which is why um, it wasn't, it, the flu is less devastating each year than COVID was in the initial pandemic phase uh, when we had no cross protectivity. Now that people have either been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 or have been vaccinated, we're starting to get cross protectivity against the new strains. So even if people get the new strains, it generally is not impacting them as hard as when people first got the strain without ever having seen any antigens that look like that before. So like I said, we can use this immunological specificity to our advantage. Uh, the adaptive immune response to one antigen uh, generally is not good against a different antigen unless they're closely related. So we try to find antigens uh, that are closely related to other things. So uh, vaccination, right? Taking a non-infectious microbe, cowpox, which doesn't cause very bad disease. We can inoculate people with that and the antigens will build antibodies that will prevent infection with smallpox, which is very devastating. It causes all these lesions and can be deadly. So uh, this is the most common way that we went about vaccination. We used either killed pathogens, so they've been destroyed, or we took live but crippled, which is called attenuated strains of pathogens. Um, so they, they can't cause disease anymore, but they're still in there and they still have some antigens that we can recognize. Or you can take things like microbial toxins and use those. That was the main way that we've vaccinated in the past. Now, as we know, we have new technologies like mRNA vaccines, which are super cool because we don't need to have killed pathogens or live attenuated pathogens in there at all. We just put the mRNA for the antigen in and our bodies make it and respond to it. This gives us huge flexibility because now we can do many different antigens and things like this. We don't have to um, hope that our attenuated strains are actually attenuated and won't reactivate, things like this. Uh, so the mRNA vaccine has changed vaccination incredibly. And we'll talk more about vaccination in chapter 17. So I want to put this concept into perspective. You have probably gotten a rhinovirus, right? It causes the common cold. And you've probably gotten the common cold many, many times. Uh, so there are hundreds of different types of rhinoviruses out there. Why do we keep getting them if we're supposed to be building this memory response? Well, the problem is that there are very unique antigens and very little cross protection. So our antibodies are very specific uh, to each individual rhinovirus. So this one, it comes in and your body builds an immune response to it. And you won't get this specific type of rhinovirus again, but a different strain of rhinovirus comes along. It has slightly different antigens. Your antibodies, these little green things, they're not going to recognize that new strain. So you will get the common cold again. So this is the problem here, right? Specificity is great for attacking the right thing, but it provides little cross protectivity. Okay, so that's the big picture. We have this concept of antigens that can elicit an antibody response or an immune response is a better term for it. Uh, we rely heavily on the antigen presenting cells like macrophages to degrade parts of the microbe and take the antigens and show them to the adaptive immune system. We have the humoral immunity that's for uh, extracellular infections uh, that uses the B cells to differentiate into plasma cells, which secrete tons of antibody proteins. 
Cellular immunity involves cytotoxic T cells, and they're going to kill infected host cells. So that's dealing with intracellular infections. We also have helper T cells, which are kind of linking the two parts together. Proteins are our best, what we call immunogens, things that uh, cause an immune response. Um, and then um, we have antigenic specificity. So the more specific you recognize it, the more likely you're only going to attack that uh, protein. Whereas low specificity, you might have cross protectivity. But the problem with that is you might also have false positives and respond to things that you don't need to. Okay, that's it for 16.1. We will continue on in 16.2.